We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please visit our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. And excited this morning for our time in the Word and how fitting the time in the Word today is going to be, especially in light of the event that took place uh, last night with the assassination attempt on former President Trump. And that event, the event of last night, is certainly in the category of the events that uh, we will remember where we were when we heard the news. You know, I think of um, September 11th of 2001. I remember where I was when I heard the news of the planes that had, um, were flown into the World Trade Center. I remember the events of where I were just a couple of years ago here in Charlottesville and the United Right rally and, rally and the, the tragedy around, around that rally and that event. I remember where I was when I heard the news. Uh, last night is one of those events that falls into that category. I was even thinking about it for Carrie and I and our children. Uh, it's probably the first event in their lifetime that they will remember where they were uh, when they heard the news of this assassination attempt. And as I'm setting myself last night in front of the television and I'm flipping back and forth between the different news sources, I expected or I expected a couple of things um, from what I was hearing. And I was very intentional to kind of go back and forth between the different news sources. And I heard two things that I expected to hear. Uh, The first thing that I heard was both sides were pointing fingers at the other one. If it wasn't for them, this would not have happened. Um, And then the second thing that I heard was speaking of uh, just the rhetoric, political rhetoric in our country right now. And we have to dial down the political rhetoric. And I heard both of those things. And um, of course, with the first one, there's probably like truth in, you know, both sides of it. And then, of course, with the political rhetoric, that's very, very true. But then I thought, like, what a tragedy for our country to think that just dialing down the rhetoric is going to fix the issue. You see, our nation does not have a rhetoric issue. Our nation has a heart issue. And you can try to fix behavior. You can try to dial down behavior. You can try to modify behavior. But unless you deal with the root issue of the heart the behavior simply is going to come back. Like you're just treating the symptoms, you're putting a Band-Aid on those things. And you think of the words of Jesus, this is exactly what he said in Matthew chapter number 15. He said, it's from the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. And then he says, hey, by the way, it's not just the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks, it's out of the heart that come all issues in life. Out of the heart comes adultery. Out of the heart comes fornication. It's out of the heart that comes murder. It's it's out of the heart that comes unforgiveness. It's out of the heart that comes uh, bitterness and resentment. It's out of the heart that comes racism. It's out of the heart that comes an indifference for a justice and indifference for those who were in poverty. Like it's out of the heart that all issues ultimately come. Like you name the issue. I don't care what it is. Maybe it's a marriage issue, maybe a financial issue. You do understand like you can fix the symptoms, but the issue is ultimately a heart issue. And the gospel is the only hope for our heart issue. The gospel is the only hope for any issue that we see or that we personally experience in our lives. And so it's with that idea in mind that we step this morning into the gospel of John chapter five. And if you're new to our church, this summer we've spent time journeying through the gospel of John and we're stepping this morning into John chapter number five. And truthfully, there could not be a more fitting passage for the event that we saw unfold and really for the division that's in our country now. There could not be a more fitting chapter. Now, I wanna just warn you up front, this is probably one of the most complex and complicated chapters in all of the Gospel of John. And so I'm just gonna encourage you to really dial in with me now, to really follow along with me as we dive in 
And what I've done is I've broken this chapter into three major sections, okay? So there are 47 verses, but these 47 verses ultimately fall into three major categories. Now, I'll remind you from last week, as we were looking at John chapter four, Jesus has this encounter with this woman at the well in Samaria, Then at the end of John chapter four, he travels back into Galilee to Cana and then he heals an official son in Capernaum. Okay, so it feels like Jesus is kind of like bouncing around geographically, but I just wanna remind you, this is important, that John is recording these events, not chronologically, he's recording them thematically, right? So with that in mind, In this chapter, John chapter five, what Jesus is gonna say, the next, or what John is gonna say is, the next thing I wanna tell you about is when Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And there's a major shift happening here. Up until this point, John has been showing the connection between Jesus and Jewish institutions. Now we're gonna see a shift to this connection between Jesus and Jewish festivals. Now with that thought in mind, that background in mind, We step this morning into the first 15 verses of chapter five, and I've called these verses, um, I've given them the title, this section, Breaking the Law, okay, Breaking the Law. And you'll see why I called it this in just a moment. Verse number one, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. There's this connection, the shift to Jesus and the fulfillment of the feast, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. And in these, verse three, in these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. Verse five, one man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. Now, if you you didn't catch this, let me just hit pause here a moment and show you something. I went from verse number three to verse number five. Verse three to verse five. In fact, some of you, your version of the Bible may include a verse number four. All right, let me tell you what happens here. I'm reading from the ESV. The ESV is one of these versions that was translated from the earliest manuscripts. The earliest Greek manuscripts that we have did not include a verse number four. Later Greek manuscripts from which other versions were translated, like the King James Version, They included a verse number four, but when they are included, or when verse four is included, it's very clear that this was kind of added at a later date. All right, now what did verse number four include? The verse that's missing in what we're reading is that there was a legend that an angel would stir the waters of this pool, and the first person that entered into the pool after the waters were stirred were healed, okay? The legend was that these waters had healing qualities. And so it was kind of a race to be the first one into the pool after these waters were stirred. So this man, he's been an invalid for 38 years. Now, before I go any further, I actually have a picture I wanna show you that we know exactly where this pool of Bethesda is. In fact, this was taken from our last trip to Israel. And here we are, we're looking down over the pool of Bethesda. Okay, this is the actual pool. It was discovered actually not that long ago in excavations in Jerusalem. And the reason we're looking down on it is keep in mind, centuries have passed since this time and the road system, the city of Jerusalem had been built up over time. And so we're looking down over this pool. This is an actual place where this this happened. I wanted you to, to see that. Now look at verse number six. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he'd already been there for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? And the sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and he walked. Look at these words. Now that day was the Sabbath. Verse 10. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. Now think about this. This man had been in this state for 38 years. Waiting on his healing for 38 years. Jesus says the word, and he's healed. 
This is what he's been waiting on his whole life, this miracle. He's been waiting on it his whole life. Jesus heals him. And the religious leaders are so blind to their religion that all that they're concerned with is it's an unlawful for you to take up your bed and walk. You see, the religious leaders over time had put this jagged performance-based edge around the law of God. And the reason they put a jagged performance-based edge around the law of God, and this happens throughout the Old Testament times and intertestamental period, is because they were trying to control the behavior of the people. Why were they trying to control behavior? Because they were tired of God's judgment upon them. So let's put a long list of do's and don'ts around the law so that we can control people's behavior. And this long list is what is called the oral traditions. In fact, in Matthew chapter number 15, Jesus says, you set aside the commandments of God for the sake of your own traditions. And these oral traditions here, according to their oral traditions, there were 39 things that were unlawful to do on the Sabbath. One of which was taking up your bed and moving it from one place to another. Okay, the issue isn't that this man was healed or that wasn't their issue with him. Their issue was, is that he, he had moved his, his bed. In other words, there was this huge emphasis on what had happened externally in terms of his behavior against the oral traditions that they had missed this mighty move of God. And so this presents a huge problem for them. It's not law for you to, for you to take up your bed. In verse 11, but he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. I'm just doing what Jesus told me to do. And they asked him, well, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now, the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Verse 14 says, and afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Now, this is very important. Throughout John's gospel, time and again, he will drip into his gospel language that implies discipleship. And this word found is one of those words. Jesus found this man. Jesus encountered this man and he was healed and Jesus still pursues this man. Okay, that's discipleship. Jesus takes the initiative. You come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Jesus pursuing you does not stop there. Jesus continues to pursue you. Jesus is continuing to pursue your heart. It's not like, oh, he's found me and now he's good. No, Jesus continues to pursue us. And he tells the man, hey, by the way, you're well, make sure that you sin no more so that nothing worse happens. And Jesus doesn't mince words here. There is a clear connection in the Greek that what this man had experienced was a consequence of his sin. And Jesus very directly says to him, hey, repent or there will be greater consequences. You know, it's not a very popular message, but the reality is, is that there are consequences for our sin. There are consequences for our sin. And what Jesus calls us to is repentance. He's like, why would you settle for that and its consequences when you can have intimacy and relationship with me? Okay, this is very important language around discipleship. Repent is what he's communicating. See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. And the man went away and he told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. Now, this is very important. When we talk about this section, breaking the law, it wasn't the law that Jesus was breaking. Jesus was breaking their interpretation of the law. Jesus is the author of the law. Jesus never had a conflict with the law of God throughout his ministry. The conflict was always with the religious leaders interpretation of the law. They had attached to the law, elevated to the level of the law, their oral traditions, this list of do's and don'ts, their attempt at behavior modification. And what does Jesus say? He comes and he confronts their oral traditions. He confronts their idea of who God is. You see, the 
big message here is this, is you can't put me into a box. Oswald Chambers says this so well. So often, it's not Jesus that we worship, it's our idea of Jesus. And don't confuse the two. Because many times there's a big discrepancy between who Jesus is and your idea of who you want him to be. And Jesus is confronting this. You know, I think about this in light of the message I preached back on May the 5th. If you didn't hear it, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it, especially in light of election season, especially in light of the events of last night. And I gave one long message on how we as believers are to responsibly engage in this election process. And do you remember back in the book of Joshua when Joshua has this encounter with the commander of the Lord's army and Joshua says to him, hey, whose side are you on? Are you on their side? Are you on our side? And the commander of the Lord's army, Jesus says, I didn't come to take sides. I came to take over. And this is what Jesus is saying here. He's saying to these religious leaders, you're missing the point. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's about a relationship. You're missing the point. And by the way, I'm not gonna fit into your man-made box. So many of us, again, we have this mindset of who God is. And what God does is he comes and he confronts their mindset. He confronts, confronts their religious system. And he's saying, look, you can change the behavior all you want, but I came for the heart. That's what I'm after. So we look here at these next few verses. Verses 16 through 18, I'm calling this section decision to prosecute. Verses 16 through 18, decision to prosecute. He's broken their idea their interpretation of the law. Now we see a decision to prosecute. Verse 16, and this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Doing these things. It's written in the imperfect tense in the Greek, which just simply means it was an ongoing habit. Jesus is continuing to press the issue. He's continuing to press their their mindset. In verse 17 says, but Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. And I cannot overstate how important verse 17 is to understanding this entire chapter. I'm gonna read it again and I'm gonna explain it. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. The background to understanding this statement is found in a debate that happened and occurred among Jewish rabbis regarding Genesis chapter number two, verse number one, and God resting on the seventh day from creation. Remember in Genesis 1, the first six days God created and Genesis 2, 1 says that on the seventh day, God rested. And there are those who say that while God rested from creating on the seventh day, on the seventh day, he entered into his sustaining work of creation. In other words, if God didn't enter into his sustaining work of creation, then what he had created would have fallen into disorder and chaos. Which, if you think about it, the same is true today. A lot of times we don't make this connection, but even now, even as I speak, day after day, moment after moment, do you realize creation that's unfolding around us is evidence of the sustaining work of our creator? It's all evidence of the sustaining work of our creator. So it's with that sustaining work in mind, look at verse 17 again, that Jesus says, my father is working until now and I am working. And what Jesus is saying is, is that based upon your interpretation of the law of God, then God himself broke the Sabbath. And Jesus says, and by the way, me too. You see, Jesus is breaking them out of this box that they have put God into. Hence, verse number 18, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, meaning I am God's son, 
making himself equal with God. So not only for these religious leaders is Jesus breaking the Sabbath, their interpretation of the law of God, but now in their eyes, Jesus is guilty of blasphemy. So it's with that thought in mind that we're gonna step into this final part of John chapter three, verses 19 through 47. And I've simply given them this title, On Trial, On Trial. And what we're gonna see is we're gonna see a trial unfold between Jesus and these religious leaders. Verse number 19, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows himself all that he himself is doing and greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. Now, three important things from what we just read. Number one is this, is we see an unyielding commitment of Jesus to the will of the father. And we've seen this from the very beginning of the gospel of John. We see him redefining relationship after relationship after relationship in saying that my pursuit is the Father's will. Number two, I want you to notice this here in verse number 20. This is key to understanding what Jesus is communicating. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. In other words, it's the doing that flows out of intimacy with the Father. In other words, it's intimacy and then there's activity, there's being, and then there's, there's doing. And we see this discipleship language all through the gospel of John, abiding in the vine and you will bear fruit. It's about a relationship. It's more than just the doing. It's more than the external world. This is about a relationship with God. And out of the relationship, this being flows the doing of our lives. If you try to fix yourself from the outside in, it won't last. This is inside out change. This is this language here. Now, the third thing from this is these greater works that Jesus is referring to are ultimately two things as we're about to see. Number one, Jesus's ability to both give life and number two, his ability to execute judgment, both of which are given by, from the Father. So let me just show you here in verse 21, for as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. And in just a little bit in the gospel of John, John chapter 11, we're gonna see an evidence of this. Lazarus, come forth. An illustration of what Jesus is teaching here. Verse 22, for the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Now, this isn't new. If you're in the first century world and you're reading John's gospel, think back to a couple of weeks ago. Pastor Matt did an amazing job of teaching through John chapter three. What did Jesus say in this message to this religious leader, Nicodemus? John chapter three, verse number 19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. And now with this life and judgment in mind, these two works that Jesus has been given, back to John 5, 24, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him, who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. In other words, Jesus says that believe in me as the son of God, as the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, as the perfect sinless sacrifice for our sins. When you turn to me, Okay, I am the one who took upon myself the wrath of God poured out against all sin. The law requires that there be a sinless, perfect, unblemished sacrifice for sin. The law requires a blood sacrifice. 
And Jesus says, I am the one. I am the one who both offers life and executes judgment. And the very second that you turn to Jesus as the sacrifice for your, your sin, you have life and you are no longer under judgment. But when you fail to yield to him, when you fail to come to the light, then judgment is upon you already. But Jesus says it doesn't have to be that way. Believe in me. Turn to me. It's more than a mental ascent to who Jesus is. It is a turning with your entire being, with your heart. Not just your behavior. It's your heart that Jesus is after. And you turn to him with all of your heart. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9. You see, they want to make it a behavior issue, and Jesus says, no, it's a heart issue. Turn to me with your whole heart. Turn to me. The gospel is ultimately the law fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And the law requires a blood sacrifice and Jesus is our sacrifice, our final once and for all sacrifice. You see what Jesus has done is he's saying, not only am I Lord over the Sabbath, I am Lord over all of eternal life. And I alone can offer you life. Jesus is saying, I am the final piece to the puzzle. You know, one of the things that um, we do from time to time as a family is we will have a, a puzzle and I don't know what like initiates it, but we'll come across a puzzle. We should put a puzzle together and we'll put it out on the kitchen table and we'll just kind of work on it over the course of a few days or a week or so. And it's really interesting to watch what happens when this puzzle starts to come together because as we get nearer the completion of it, like you can just feel the intensity around it, like start to ramp up. I probably have something to do with that, but... Um, <laughs> You can just feel it kind of start to ramp up and you get down to near the end of it and you're like, who's going to be the one to put the final piece of the puzzle together? And so as we get closer and closer to the end, we start to spend a little more time on it, more time on it, more time on it. And we're family, we're kind of circled around it. And I'm not sure where the uh, kids have picked up on this from. Again, probably me at some point, although I don't remember this, but at some point, okay, they've learned this. Well, we get down to the final handful of pieces and one of them will hold a piece back. <laughs> and you get down to the final couple of pieces, it's like, we're missing a piece. And you start to look around at their faces. And... But you get down to the end and whoever has that final piece, they put it in place and the picture's complete. And what Jesus is saying is that with my sacrifice on the cross, the picture is complete. The price for your sin has been paid once and for all. Once and for all. And if you continue to try to live life apart from me and my sacrifice for your sin, you're already under judgment. It's not a one day thing, it's a now thing. But the moment you believe, the moment that you turn to Jesus with your heart, you go from judgment to eternal life in that moment. And this is what John is communicating here with this message, this teaching from Jesus. He's not just Lord of the Sabbath, he's Lord over all of life. Verse 25, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. And so there's this now element to verse number 25. And in verses 26 and 27, Jesus restates both his, 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 uh, his ability to offer life and, and bring judgment. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him the authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. 
Verse 28, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who were in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So there's this now element to both life and judgment, but there's also the to come element of both life and judgment, meaning the final judgment that is to come. Now, we read this and we think, wait a minute, this seems works-based, and it's not. In fact, I want to encourage you, John chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. In fact, I'll read them very, very quickly for you. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. In other words, it's the works that flow either out of yielding to Jesus as the light or rejecting Jesus as the light. In other words, the works are just simply going to reveal the condition of the heart. Your life, your works are telling a story. Now, what we're going to see in the remainder here is this shift in Jesus' teaching. He's been referring to himself as the son. Now he's going to start using the pronoun I. I can do Verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. Again, this perfect completion of the law of God. You see, according to Jewish law, truth had to be established by two or three witnesses. And Jesus fulfills the law. Matthew 5, 17, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. I came that they might be fulfilled. Deuteronomy 19, 15, here's the law. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses shall a charge be established. And it's with this trial in mind, I said on trial, What we're going to see in the remainder of John chapter 5 is Jesus one by one is going to start calling witnesses to the stand. One by one. Now, as we read it, it seems like it's on Jesus that's, it seems like it's Jesus who is on trial. But the irony here is this. It's not Jesus on trial. It's the religious leaders who are on trial. Jesus turns the tables He calls us first witness, verse 32. There is another who bears witness about me. And I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. It's the testimony of the father. The second witness he calls in verses 33 through 35. You sent to John, meaning John the Baptist, and he has borne witness to the truth. Verse 36, Jesus calls the next witness his works. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. Verses 37 and 38, Jesus calls the next witness, the Father in heaven. And the Father who has sent me has himself borne witness about me. Verses 39 through 43, Jesus calls the next witness, the scriptures, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness about me. And then as we get down to the end of this chapter, the final witness is called. Verses 45 through 47, Moses himself. Look at verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the father. There is one who accuses you, meaning he already accuses you. Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote of me. But if you did not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And this was an eye-opening statement for these religious leaders. And what Jesus has said, if you truly believe Moses, if you believe the law that was given to Moses, if you believe the commands that was given to Moses, If you truly believe them, then you would believe me. Because all of those things and all of the witnesses that I've called today all point to who I am as the Son of God. You know, when I read this, 
it can feel a little bit complicated when we begin to talk about the law of God and thinking of the Old Testament, the connection to the New Testament. It's a lot, I know. And in times when I'm reading the word and it feels very, very complicated, of course, mentally, I want to continue to press through that. I want to continue to try to understand God's word and so on. But at the end of the day, what I come back to is this encounter that Jesus has with religious leaders in Matthew chapter 22. When he is asked, teacher, what is the greatest law that there is? And Jesus says that the greatest law, the greatest command is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Jesus says that ultimately the word of God comes down to that. It's not about your behavior. It's about a love relationship with God. It's about allowing the love of God to transform your heart. You were an enemy with God, yet Jesus came and died for you. He died in your place so that you wouldn't have to, so that you could have a relationship with God. And Jesus didn't stop there. He then says, and the second is like it, meaning the same as, that you love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, and these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, all of God's word, all of the law of God, it comes down to you love God and you love your neighbor. That you love God and out of that love for God flows an overflow of that love and a love for people, a genuine, authentic love for people. This is why you see the words everywhere, whether it's on our walls or on our website. Love God, love people, love life. For me, I have to keep it that simple. And the good news is that Jesus says it all comes down to that. But you can never truly love people unless your heart has first been transformed by the love of God. And so what does that mean? Is that when I understand that I was an enemy of God, that I hated God, yet Jesus still pursues me. Jesus comes after me. Jesus died for me. He paid the price that I should have paid. When I truly get the gospel in my heart and in my mind, I then understand, oh, okay. Like that means I love not just the people that are easy to love. I love the people that are hard to love as well because I was hard to love. I love the people that I think deserve my love. And then I love the people that I don't think they deserve my love because we didn't deserve his love yet he still loved us. You see, this love is not optional, nor is it forced. It comes out of this abiding relationship with Jesus because this gospel, this love that has fulfilled the law of God, it transforms your heart in such a way that it begins to overflow into every horizontal relationship. And so what that means is that I love Republicans and I love Democrats. I love them. What that means is I love the people that are easy to love. I love the people that are hard to love. I love the people that look like me. I love the people who don't look like me. It is this love that begins to transform every relationship, every human relationship in your life. And it's not optional, but it's a love you can't hold back. because it's a love that we have been loved with, this great love of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I just think the perfect call for action, even out of this passage and in light of the events that unfolded last night in our country, is to really examine our hearts. Is there any anger, any unforgiveness, any bitterness, any resentment, any unforgiveness, any racism, any indifference that's in our hearts towards another person. And today, to look to Jesus, whether it's for the first time or look to him again and ask for him to transform, truly transform your heart with the love of Jesus Christ. So we're gonna stand to our feet now at all of our campuses. And Father, we wanna say thank you for this morning, for this time in your word. And God, today, may we look to the cross 
and may you change us. God, may we consider who we were, how we rejected you. We turned from you. We were enemies with you. Yet you relentlessly pursued us with your love. God, I pray that we would remind it, be reminded of your great love for us, the gospel, and that with the gospel that you would change us. We forgive because we were forgiven. We love because we have been loved. And God, I pray for any relationship right now. I pray for anything in our heart that's hindering relationships, that God, you would touch it this morning. And I pray especially for those who've never trusted you as Lord and Savior. God, right now they're under judgment, but you're giving them the opportunity right now to turn to the light, to turn to life. May this moment before us be the moment that they believe. And as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, everyone's very still and quiet. If you have never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you the opportunity right now to turn to him in belief, true belief and true surrender. If that's you today, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer out loud after me. And I'm going to invite the rest of us to pray it out loud as well, just to support and encourage those who are making this decision today. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your word. I understand my need of salvation, that I am a sinner in need of a savior. I believe that Jesus died for me, that he rose again. Come into my heart, cleanse me of my sin, and I ask for the courage to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.